this week, we've got questions on St. Gregory the Great, Victor Hugo, the church in China, and is the mental health crisis in America tied to a lack of faith? Welcome to another episode of Off the Menu, now being broadcast and podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be at crusadechannel.com. I'm your host, Vincent Franchini from Tumblr House, here with a microaggressed Charles Coulomb. Microaggressed? You mean someone has been microaggressing me? You allege. I allege? allege? Yeah. Are you, well, well, what are you saying that that I'm 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 retreating to a safe space of some kind in in the face of this this microaggression? Yeah, you tend to do that. So to pull in my pull in my tentacles and retreat into my shell. Yeah, absolutely. You've you've got your little safe spaces, your little in your in your little castle in Austria with your other dark academics. Well, there's that. As we study <laughs> forbidden arcane disciplines <laughs> and run around wearing primarily tweeds. That's true. <laughs> against the uh, against a dark gothic setting. Yeah. So, well, well, let's see. We've got cottage core. We've got dark academia. These are we're still on this, ladies and gentlemen. Although I think I think there's a, a little bit of self help. Now being added to this, what do you think self help from a dark academic would sound like? I mean, imagine a dark academic uh, life coach. Ooh, that's a tough call. Well, see, I mean, does dark dark academic? I mean, are they typically going to be Catholic and Christian and and serious? See, I don't, I don't know the full range. Well, life coach. They're, they're, there aren't too many Catholic life coaches, firstly. They tend to be sort of new agey. Oh, that's true. Okay. So I, I don't think religion would really come up. But being dark academic, the solutions might be a little bit different. You know, where where a typical life coach would tell you to look look within yourself and, you know, accept yourself for who you are, be mindful, all that kind of stuff, right? A dark academic uh, life coach might say, um, you know, if – if you feel that you're you haven't really lived up to your potential or that you're you're trapped in full routines or structures it could be that you're being dominated by alien entities from beyond this dimension that's that's where the dark academic life coach would go alien entities from a different dimension <laughs> yeah they could it could be or it, it may be that your uh, it may be that your your life path is being obstructed by the intervention of uh, evil spirits. Okay, yeah, I, I can see that for sure. No, no, and so it would be it would be the kind of thing where uh, you know you'd say, well, perhaps you don't need a life coach as much as you do an exorcist. Definitely. I, I was actually thinking that, like, that's not too far off from what Father Ripker says, but with different language. Different language. And, well, see, of course, it could work another way, too. Uh, depending upon the branch of dark academia, it could be uh, often you, you perhaps find yourself repeating patterns of behavior. Could this be the result of repeated alien abductions? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think these are the questions that a dark academic life coach would ask his client to to examine. And you're, you know, you did a, spent a lot of time in Roswell, New Mexico, and it's funny how you seem to be gravitating to all these <laughs> alien abduction type themes well it's not just that don't forget that the college i went to in in uh, roswell is done in military gothic and it looks like dark academia like you wouldn't believe in the desert yeah i know but there it is wow 
Now, not not to say, not to stay too too closely to the weird, but in real time, yesterday was the feast of Saint Patrick. Yeah. And the feast of Saint Joseph of Arimathea, patron of Glastonbury, home of English New Agery. So there's a connection there, and also Saint Patrick went to Glastonbury. But wait, there's more. It just so happens that at this establishment I'm at right now, we celebrated St. Patrick's Day today. And I gorged on corned beef and cabbage. Beautiful. Wonderful. It wasn't just any corned beef, though, because it was home cured right here on the premises. It's good, but, you know, save some room for tomorrow when the big important feast day happens. You know what I mean? What, the uh, fourth Sunday in Lent? <laughs> you know what? If you if you want to be out of St. Joseph's good graces, do so at your, <laughs> at your own risk. No, it's just that this year St. Joseph's Day has been pushed forward to March 20th. March 20th? Yeah. So that's Monday. Because, yeah, because it, to this year the 19th is a Sunday. So they pushed them forward. But that means that if you wanted to, today or tomorrow, you know where you could take yourself? Where? St. Peter's Italian Catholic Church in downtown LA. I, I know. People have been telling me that. The St. Joseph's table there is amazing, as is the free spaghetti dinner. Although you've got to pay if you want meatballs and or sausage. Fair, fair. And I'll tell you, if I were in L.A. right now, you know what I would have done for St. Patrick's Day? Um, Where? Go to the Tam Shanter? Yeah, I'd go to the Tam. <laughs> and then on Monday, I would be heading off to St. Peter's Italian for the Italian English Mass and the uh, St. Joseph's Table celebration and all that free spaghetti and Dago red wine that they wash it down with. Why do you have to say that all the time? That hurts me. What well, Dago Red? I'm, I'm I'm Italian myself. I found out, so you know, suck it up, man up. I mean, you're Italian, but it's also like, like like what? You're not really claiming it. You know what I mean? Like you're you're not really identifying. I mean, it's there, and you're using it to your own uh, selfish ends, like you know, selfish. to sort of kind of give you some sort of of credibility but Street really crap. like you're not with us when someone insults assaults italians like you're not there with us oh yeah let me tell you something now that i found out that i'm part italian if uh, if don giovanni was still with us i'd be a made man i'd be a full member of the family yeah uh-huh i could have been in the line of succession I don't know. I think it, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. I feel like it's like the the Native Americans, where it's like, you know, like they have to test you or something, like in order to get like a like a cut from the casino uh, profits. Like, well, I think I should get a cut from the casino profits. I'm part of it too. <laughs> Go ahead, just okay, Pocahontas. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Pocahontas. <laughs> Elizabeth Warren, uh, hardly knew ye. <laughs> she and I were initiated together as braves of the same tribe. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! It's true. She counted. She she brought in eight scalps. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, they only needed four, but because she wasn't really in the end, she had to bring eight. They they doubled the amount. On her. <laughs> Anyway, now she's getting her cut of the casino money too, so it's all right. We're all we're all making dough. <laughs> That's great, Charles. I'm glad. Glad it worked out for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out fine. Everybody's cashing in. It's great. I mean, we're all Indian. We're all Italian. We're all whatever we want to be. Pay up. <laughs> see, see the cash register on your way out. They'll give you a voucher. You're fine. Everybody's cashing in, ladies and gentlemen. Bring the chips up to the house door. It's great. Everything's wonderful now. I I think 
I think, ladies and gentlemen, we, what we need is the president who's going to announce that everybody's everything and we're all <laughs> entitled. We all we all reserve our entitlements. I don't know where the money's coming from. We're all getting some. <laughs> everybody's getting a cut. <laughs> Cow's gonna be milked till it falls over, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's gonna happen after that. As long as I get my no, I won't care. <laughs> I, I want my entitlements, and I want them now. Oh gosh. No, well, all right. So we've got St. Patrick's Day, St. Joseph's Day, Lent. Fast away, the old year passes. Um. Starting a week from today, I will leave my happy home in Austria and be headed for the three kingdoms, Ireland, Scotland, well, Ireland, England, and Scotland in terms of where we're going to be there. Would you believe where I'm going to spend Palm Sunday? Where? In a neat little town they call Belfast. Dee, 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 dee. And away from my friends and relations, betrayed by the black velvet band. Her eyes, they showed like the diamonds. I thought her the queen of the land. And her hair hang over her shoulder, tied up in a black velvet band. Mm. Belfast, can you believe it? Can't believe it, no. Well, uh, the next time you see me, next week, it will in all likelihood be in a hotel of some kind in Dublin. Wow. Dublin, Ireland. So you see, it'll go like this, ladies and gentlemen. This is the way the Three Kingdoms tour is going to go, don't you know? On Saturday next... A week from now, we shall fly like an eagle to the sea. Fly like an eagle. Spread your limbs and be free. You got to... Uh, sorry. Anyway, we'll fly to Dublin. Uh, do the show, I hope, Saturday night. Sunday looks like St. Kevin's in Dublin. And then uh, during, the during the course of the, um, of the week... We shall visit the Midlands, places like Granada and Tullymore, then to Galway, then up to Knock, to the Great Shrine. We'll drive through Sligo and stop and make obeisances at the grave of Walter Butler Yeats. And then we'll go see an old friend in Tyrone, County Tyrone. And then from Tyrone, we'll go to Belfast. And you know, there is a pub in Belfast that I aim to go to after Mass at the uh, Immaculate Conception. And the pub has a brilliant name. What is it? Well, you know, I've always joked that if I were to open an Irish pub, I would call it this. And what I hear is one. It's called the Crown and Shamrock. Wow. Is it... Have you, so you've never been there before? No, never been there before. I just I love the name. All right. And the website, the website makes it look good. So it's only nine minutes away from the Church of the Immaculate Conception, which is run by the uh, by the uh, 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 Institute of uh, Jesus Christ Sovereign Priest, Christ the King. I C K S P. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So they have a they have that parish in Belfast. Mm. But then we're going to fly from Belfast to Stansted in England, and it'll be three days in Cambridge. I'll see my godson. Um, we'll see um, the manor at Hemingford Gray, uh, the model for the Green Nose stories. And then after after that, Spy Wednesday, we'll go to London. Um, and we've got to divide Holy Week and Easter between St. Bede's Clapham Place and um, St. Um, Mary Madeline uh, Wandsworth. 
Then, Oxford, York, Edinburgh. Culminating the following weekend in Inverness, where we'll see Ross McEwen, and that's where we'll do the show from Inverness. Beautiful. Uh, so the Saturday, I'll uh, I'll go to the Culloden uh, during the day. I'll go to the Culloden uh, commemoration at the battle at the battlefield of Culloden. Uh, I've been there before, but I've never been for the the uh, commemoration. And then we shall fly back from Inverness to Vienna. When is that? Is that is that after Easter or before Easter? That's after Easter. Easter wow. will be in London. Wow. So it's quite the quite the uh, itinerary, and we'd be happy to see anybody who wants to be seen. Uh, all of course, all offers of cash gratefully accepted. Before I forget, I also have to give a shout out to the sixth grade class of St. Mary's Byzantine Catholic School in Parma, Ohio. Wow. Is that attached to Mrs. Coyne? Who is, who, who, what is that about? Well, a classmate of mine for the ITI is uh, now teaching that sixth grade class, Mike Foster. And earlier in the week, he had me lecture them about the Trojan War. And then uh, they asked if I could give a shout out on the show. And I said, yeah, sure. So I just did. You did a you did a virtual lecture? Yeah. Wow, that's really cool. I didn't know they were doing that in school now. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, nobody reads anymore, so they've got to do what they can. Also, also, well, I'm sure those kids read, but never mind. Also, today in real time is March 18th. It's a presidential birthday. Um, who? Grover Cleveland. Why do you know that? What do you mean, why do I know that? It's Cleveland's birthday. It's a, it's a federal holiday, isn't it? it when's Obama's birthday? When, when's Obama's birthday? <laughs> Hmm? He doesn't have a birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Obama doesn't get a birthday. <laughs> oh, man. I don't know Trump's birthday either, so, you know. Um, what's Andrew Jackson's birthday? Uh, it's two days ago. Wow, okay. You actually are you really? You knew you knew that offhand. Yeah, that's fascinating. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not stupid. <laughs> oh, it's, not it's... My, it's not my fault. I blame my parents. Anyway, Andrew Jackson's dead, but Grover Cleveland will live on forever in our hearts. And here's a bit of presidential trivia for you. Abraham Lincoln, James Garfield, and McKinley were all assassinated. What historical personage was present at all three assassinations and, as a result, came to believe himself as a jinx and became a total recluse? So McKinley's was like 1900. Yep. And Lincoln's... What were the other ones? Yeah. Uh, the one in the middle was Garfield, 1880-something. I don't know. Some senator. I don't know. Um, Robert, T- Robert Todd Lincoln. I'm not familiar. Who is that? A- Abraham Lincoln's son. He was president when his father was shot. He was president when Garfield was shot. He was president when McKinley was shot. So he came to the conclusion that he was some sort of weird presidential jinx, and he became a recluse and hit out and never went to Washington again. Wow. I didn't even know Abraham Lincoln had a son, let alone that he was in present at these things. 
Oh. Now you know. Isn't it great to tune in to Off the Menu? You learn all kinds of things you wouldn't have known otherwise. That's for sure. That's what I've been saying all the time. All right. See? It's just because you say it doesn't mean it isn't true. Well said. All right. Uh, <laughs> I, I think you should take a little time out and just, just try to be in the moment. Just kind of let yourself be who you are. Don't. I don't think you should try to make the now happen. I think, I think you should just give yourself permission to accept yourself. And if you're not happy with where you are, what you are right now, that's okay. Give it time. Take a little, a little moment out to to, to self care and self heal. Be good to yourself. Don't 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 feel you have to push yourself into a, a bold or. Or, or force yourself to go into, into some sort of, of of space that's alien to you. Just just try to be be in the present and 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 feel feel accepting of who you are right now. Be mindful of where you are. I mean the chair you're sitting in, the posters on the wall, the door that you're close to. Where that door goes, the hallway, the, the bookshelves beyond it. Think about all those things. Make them part of you. But remember, you're not confined to them. Remember that you're more than that, but you don't need to be more than that. Be it. Don't see it. All right. Well, what we're going to do is I'm going to turn that into a YouTube short. And then we're going to put it as one of these short clips on YouTube. And you're probably going to have a <laughs> profession coming out of this. <laughs> you think I could be a life coach? Life coach slash ASMR talk or whatever. Whatever this spot space is that merges all these things into like one weird. Go gooey. Gooey blob. <laughs> <laughs> well, should I, if I do that, should I add a little bit of dark academia to it? Don't do that. I think that that's like a weird ingredient <laughs> that m makes it unsettling. <laughs> really? You mean like to sometimes feel that the, the plaything of forces beyond your control? Well, maybe you are. It could be that the identity you've always claimed as your own your whole life is incomplete and that in fact you're a sort of unlikely hybrid between well human beings and things from outside this is crazy you know one of these people i um gosh a long time ago maybe 15 years ago i actually knew a person who was tr genuinely honest to goodness trying to tell me that his family intermarried with demons and that there was like this weird mix and like the proof of of this was i guess he was in this accident and didn't get hurt he was like this unbreakable person and he credited that to this weird genetics I, not joking at all like one iota um did you I ever meet his mother-in-law his mother-in-law? Oh well, no. I yeah. mean, it's down the line. Uh, I, so, I, so it's, it's his great grandmother was a demon. I don't know. Honestly, honestly, he probably was just trying to pick up on the chick we were with. <laughs> He's probably trying to impress. Oh, I like. Uh, I like that. My my dad actually knew a fellow Paris Flamand who claimed to be part Lemurian, and he had a way to test girls to find out if they were part Lemurian. Yeah, what do you do? I really can't say. It required a certain amount of intimacy. And what drove my dad crazy was that this routine worked. <laughs> oh, man. It really annoyed him. Who did that you again? Never uh, who did that? A fellow called Paris, a fellow called Paris Flamand. You could look him up. He was a writer of some note later after my dad knew him. But 
Uh, Dad could never, ever talk about him without bringing this up and just expressing total annoyance and disgust, not just at Paris, but at the chicks who would fall for something that in, inane. Let that be a lesson, ladies. Pick up lines that are whacked. Don't don't fall for them. I mean that 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 really tests the limits. You know, I've been, uh, I've I've watched people you know be the victims of scammers and stuff and all this and that. But that's like uh, that touches the edge of my empathy <laughs> for for these. Mark, pe- you know I what can, I mean? Yeah, like, I can understand for- that. I mean, when when. When somebody falls for something that is so stupid, you just, you, you do. I mean, if I told you I gave all my money to this woman who told me that she was the Nigerian foreign minister's widow, and he was going to give me millions, and all I had to do was give her the number of my bank account, and she emptied it, you would have very little sympathy for me. Wow. All right. Um... Okay, I moving on. I guess moving on. Um, How as, can we move on as Let's one let... does? Uh, well, all we can do is take it one step at a time, Charles. Oh, one day at a time. One day at a time. Very, very, very AA. <laughs> I wouldn't know, but um, yeah. Okay, good. That's it's a good idea. Yeah. Um. Do do you think being good to yourself is a bad idea? Well, I think we can be a little too easy on ourselves sometimes, you know? Yeah, but you really shouldn't take it all on yourself. I mean, just accept the fact that there are limitations and that sometimes you just need to go with them and not, not worry too much about who or what you are. You just need to... Say to yourself, I'm okay in the moment here. All right, uh, pause for channel identification. <laughs> Off the menu is now being broadcast in podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be at crusadechannel.com. Wow, <laughs> I feel my <laughs> That was That was a real microaggression. <laughs> Weaponizing station identification. That is sad. No, it was that, you know, near the 30 minute mark, you know, I mean, and it's important to to do this sometimes, you know, you, you can't, it's just obligations, you know? Yeah, but see, yeah, I, I think that obligations really can't get in the way of finding out who you need to be right now. I think that Letting the obligations get in the way of who you are is is something that'll set you back in your development, in your growth, in your healing. And I think, in a sense, all of us need a certain amount of self healing. Like the all right, Charles, rabbit. I'm gonna let you finish. Pause for station identification. The cruise <laughs> off the menu is now being broadcasted podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be. CrusadeChannel.com. <laughs> you have really weaponized station identification. That is, you're gonna beat me with that thing like a, like a, <laughs> you're gonna beat me with it like a stick. That's this horrible. Is, this is a gift from God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me get this straight. You're gonna drop that thing on me every time we start to go off the county road. Is that it? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? <laughs> all right, pal. Two of us could play at that game. <laughs> all right, all right. You want to do that? Fine. You do that. <laughs> you, you, insanity has only just begun to fight. You think you're gonna pull that on me? Nobody pulls that on me. You understand? I'm a star. <laughs> all right, fine. Be that way. <sighs> See if I ever help you self heal. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
see if I ever help <laughs> you explore <laughs> self care. I don't. I don't want self heal coaches. I, I want to self heal on my own terms, please. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Let me. Ask, all right, fine. Let me ask you a question. Do you take anything that's free? What, what do you expect more? Something you pay for, or something you just get for free? Something I pay for. Exactly. This is my point. So you see, if you try to self-heal on your own, it'll be free. And you won't care. But if you self-heal with me, it's $200 an hour per session. Oh, wow. Self-heal with a professional. I get it. Exactly. Exactly. Now, won't that be better? <laughs> You'll respect your own self-healing a lot more if you have to pay through the nose for it. I, exactly. I think I think I want to browse more. I want I want to I want to I want to <laughs> browse other self-healing vendors. <laughs> but you don't trust my product. <laughs> I went to the catbird school of coaching. I know how to do this. I'm, I'm a professional. You remember uh, you remember Catbird's advice to the love lord lady on the phone? What do you say? Well, she she called in when he was doing this. Uh, uh, this is a character, incidentally, in Dilbert. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, he's doing a, a an agony art radio show, and this woman calls in and says she has a problem because, on the one hand, she's got a husband who's very dutiful, works very hard to take care of her, looks after her, but he's kind of dull and he's not great looking. But at the office. She's uh, she's got a uh, a coworker who's very good looking, but has basically been through all the chicks in the office, and you know is is kind of a uh, a ne'er do well, but she can't help feeling it, but feel attracted to it. So Catbird says, "Your husband sounds like a loser. Dump him." Then, <laughs> okay, then send a dead woodchuck to the guy in the office. With a note saying, unlike this woodchuck, my love for you will never die. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that, that sums it up really. Yeah, pretty much. Self help could go wildly wrong, you know. Yeah, let's not go there. Well, or I'm just saying. All right. Um, would, would would you advise anyone to send a dead woodchuck for any reason? No, please don't. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. No woodchucks. No, there's no shipping and handling for them. Definitely void were prohibited. Sorry, no CODs. All right. Um, time for the memes of production. Nationalize the memes of production for the common good. All right. So. Today we've got we've actually got uh, a proper beam uh, sent in by uh, Matthew um, it's from Twitter off the menu viewers um, and we've got a bunch of warriors uh, putting their swords around a, a you know a table I guess Knights of the Round Table I guess um, so Scottish Protestants yes we're here Italian American Roman Catholics French Canadian Roman Catholics Eastern Catholics. Irish American Roman Catholics, ordinary converts, and British recusants. Yeah. Wow, that's so pretty that's, cool. That's, no, I mean it's definitely it's a cool bunch of people. Anyway, yeah. Uh, any ortho bros? No ortho bros, huh? Yeah, strategically left out. Interesting. Um, I think Sede we have bros? a couple. We Sede have a lot. Of, we we have a lot of Sede bros. Yeah, we do. Um, uh, definitely. Do you um, have so, any Benny Benny Bros? Benny Bros? What is that? Well, you know Benny Vicantis. Oh, Benny Vicantis. Well, I thought you told me like they're not even Benny Vicantis anymore because ben, obviously he died, and they said Pope Francis is Pope now, right? Yeah, but some of them rejected the conclave in the Roman uh, motel. Okay, well, so rejected it in favor of what? Well, I guess they're saying if a countess is oh. a regular sort now. Okay. I mean, my guess. I don't know. No one's really explained it to me. Okay. But 
So uh, that's a fairly good cross section. I mean, the truth of it is, ladies and gentlemen, it's as though we've all been shipwrecked on a desert isle. <laughs> and <laughs> we'll have to make the best of it. We're here for a long, long time. Okay, if we were, if you were for real shipwrecked on a desert isle and you could only take three things with you, what would they be? An encyclopedia. Okay, that's very old school. Okay. The Bible. Well, yeah, but remember your phone is going to work. Right, I know. I uh, got you. Okay. But, I mean, you're already an encyclopedia, though, so, like, what's there? And you're on a desert island, so it's like, like, I mean, wh what do you, you're, so you're just absorbing new information no. about the world? Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. No. Okay. And the makings of a signal fire. The makings of a single fire? Si signal, signal. Okay. To let passers by know that i'm on the island what was the second thing that you you said the bible okay so you've got the bible for for spiritual reading um okay so you've got all your needs there so those are the needs of charles right there okay so also self-healing self heal okay so if there was a fourth item you would take self-healing yes <laughs> which any, which you should take everywhere you go. Okay. <laughs> what? That's fair. Yeah, it, you you know what? It's 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 your answers. You can do whatever you like with them, Charles. It's, do you feel self healed? Self healed? I don't have wounds to heal. I'm 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 too strong for wounds so, to get me down. So you're in denial. It's okay. I, <laughs> it's all right to be in denial. It's just you may be tired of it someday. I think you really, really need to give yourself permission to be whoever you are, regardless of what that looks like, regardless of what other people think it should be. I think you need to become comfortable in your own skin. Okay. You're not gonna break for station. No, I, 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 no, I was. I, you, you knew I was looking at the whip. I was, I, I was getting the whip on my whip hand, and it was coming out. But, but you cut it off, which is smart. See, you're learning. Yeah, well, I, you're I learning. This so. is how learning works. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's called Pavlov's dog. I know what it's like. He, uh, <laughs> catalyzing the cerebral cortex through pain association. <laughs> Wow. All right. Um, all right. So Mason sent in a pretty cool comment. Um, he says, Spires is one of those small but integral parts of Southern California deep lore. We were talking about this last episode, Spires, and it's a restaurant that um, Charles and I both had a lot of nostalgia over. Um, so Mason goes on and says, I don't know if this counts as a meme of production, but I wonder if Charles has ever been to Pea Soup Anderson's, which is another old Southern California, albeit not quite L.A., restaurant. If so, what are his opinions on it? Uh, we both have strong well, opinions. I think this is an epic uh, mention, Mason, because it absolutely fits 100%. Um, I'll let you. I'll let you take this one, Charles. Yeah, go ahead. Well, there are two Pea Soup Anderson's locations to serve you. One is way up north at Santanella on the Five, which I've only been to once, but it was quite nice. The other, which I've been to many times, uh, en route to um, points north from Santa Barbara, is Buellton, which is near Solving. And that's the, I think it's the, the one in Buellton is the older of the two. But it's, well, Pea Soup Madison, of course, makes pea soup. Make a lot of other things. It's a lovely, they're both very lovely restaurants, very rustic, uh, but very California. I mean, you know, a touch of the foe. Mm. 
And by I don't by foe I don't mean F O E, ladies and gentlemen. I mean F A U X. But they're good. They're good. And I, um, you know, I, I love going to P. Soup Anderson's whenever I can. And I usually will buy a can of it if I see it in the store of the P. Soup just for the sake of nostalgia. Yeah, it's very quaint marketing. You know, it's almost like, <clears throat> I don't know how else to describe it. If it's like Motel 6 marketing with that old timey jingle. But, um, you know, <clears throat> the, with the locations, being where they are, you always, at least as as a kid, when we were going on family trips, you create that association, that cognitive association, with vacation. You know, yeah. pea soup Anderson. That's like a that's like a stopover. You know, restaurant. Like, like you're going somewhere and you haven't reached there, but you know you got to stop. You know, somewhere for lunch, and that's what we, our, our family would do at least. Um, to you know, for various uh destinations they would go to i don't remember the food being so good though uh, maybe no, i just had the not, wrong thing you know it's not bad it's not bad you, you know what's another one um since we're on here um is bob's big boy oh yeah well that I was... think the only one left is in glendale oh is it okay that because that used to be a thing when they were they were kind of in that same area where they I think they were more prevalent but then they got fewer yep. and fewer and then it kind of they were in unusual locations um yeah and now and then Glendale huh I got to stop over uh, there uh, Glendale or Burbank let me see let me go to Bob's that's kind of a, a last a random place for a last last stand I'll say but oh. let's see where are they at you're right Burbank Oh wait, actually no. There's three: Burbank, um, Downey, and Northridge. It looks like Bell Gardens and Norco. That's weird. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty weird. All right. Now looking at the uh, looking at their lunch and dinner, their entrees. Choice Center Cup Top Sirloin for nineteen ninety nine. Huh. Fish and shrimp dinner, chicken fried steaks, spaghetti marinara, chicken parmesan, fish and chip dinner. Huh. Bob's Big Boy. And the location. And it's just the one in Burbank. It's the only one that this shows. That's so funny. Uh, there, um, I kind of widened the map to see a, a larger area, and there's. It said there's one in Tijuana, <laughs> oh, <laughs> but gosh. it's just Big Boy Restaurant. I guess it's um, kind of a ripoff, but um, Big Boy Restaurant, Coffee Shop, Cocktails. That's interesting. All right. Um, all right, that's it for the. Uh, oh, actually, let's let's do one more. Let's do one more comment from Jonathan. Um, good old Jonathan P. Uh, well. He says Charles earned two points on my list for having good Sicilian blood, but the Milanese blood is negative two points. So overall, hey. balances out. But he did officially. But he did officially earn the right to be called Paisan, so that's a bonus. I, I may Paisani see. Vincenzo e Carlo. Mm, see, see? <laughs> when the mood hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's a more. When you're starting to drool just like pasta fajoul, you're in love. See, I can sing that now, now that I'm an Italian. Excuse me, but you see back at old Napoli, that's Samore, Amore. Yeah, it's a good old fashioned Italian folk song. All right. Yes, <laughs> yes exactly. Uh, Anthony works at a restaurant, saving his money for someday. Right, yes. Mama okay. Leone left a, do a note on the door. <laughs> I thought we left this behind, Charles. I thought I thought I thought we were beyond. <laughs> well, no, but you have achieved what Billy Joel only wanted. Billy Joel wanted to be Italian in the worst way. Oh, did he? 
Okay. That's why he writes about so much faux Italian stuff. He wanted to be an Italian. But I have earned it. I got it. I have Italian. Hmm. Isn't that neat? Uh, I'm so happy for you. Um, okay. You should be. I mean, I can eat marinara sauce with a, with a clear conscience now. Toss back the Negro Red Wide by the half bottle. Oh, it's going to be great. I have all of these all of these Chianti bottles, you know, with the straw that I use as candle uh, holders. Okay. Um, are you <laughs> yeah. ready for State of the Week? All right. What's the State of the Week? State of the Week is Kansas. Oh, Kansas, Kansas, Kansas. Well, starting in the far east of Kansas, you have uh, Kansas City, Kansas, which is right next to Kansas City, Missouri, on that half. Uh, I believe it's on the Kansas side. You have the World War I uh, National Memorial and Museum, which is a wonderful, wonderful place. Kansas City, uh, it's not that much to write home about, but you keep going west and you come to the uh, most amazing towns, Wichita, the capital, Topeka. Topeka, Kansas is, well, I mean, the, the capital building is quite lovely. In Lawrence, Kansas, you've got the University of Kansas where John Sr. formerly held court. Uh, Manhattan, Kansas is right by Fort Riley, former home of the U.S. Cavalry with a wonderful museum. Mm. And that's pretty much what I know about uh, eastern Kansas. Go all the way out west, you'll come to a town called Salina, which has a big cathedral. And it's worth seeing, as are the cathedrals of Wichita and Topeka. And the Sunflower State is an amazing, amazing place. Um, but that's all I can tell you about it, because that's all I've seen. Hmm. What about Dodge City? I've always been interested in Dodge City. I had the chance to go there once, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to take it up. Mm. Okay. But you'll be there with Bat Masterson and Calamity Jane. Okay. Well, what's that expression based on? Get out of Dodge City. Like, what did something happen there? I mean, is that was there like? Well, it was it was like Tombstone. It was a uh, a lawless town in the days of the old West, and so they would. Getting out of Dodge meant that you were getting out just before getting shot. Interesting. But, I mean, it, that wasn't tied to a historical event, was it? No. No, okay. except that there was a high um, a high uh, mortality rate thanks to the use of, the, of firearms. Interesting. Okay. All right. Time for the questions. All right. All right, first question is from Tom, who says, Vincent and Charles, please share the origin story of Tumblr House Books. Also, Vinny, please share a memorable story or two of Charles from your early days. Charles, likewise, a story of or two of Vinny, please. Finally, finally, all you listeners, buy from Tumblr House Books. Yes. Yes, de definitely. All right. Well, Tum Tumblr House originated... Uh, when uh, Steve's brother, or yeah. Vinny's brother rather, Steve Francani, uh, he was very frustrated over the inability of Bill Beersack to sell his first novel, which was so good, which he'd read. And Steve swore that if another buyer couldn't be found, he would publish it himself. And that was the origin of Tumble House Books. Hmm. Um, a story about Vinny. There's so many. Let me see. Ah. When Vinny was eight years old, his brother Steve, his big brother, had a piano recital. And uh, Mrs. Frankini and little Vinny, as he was then, 
and I went to go see Steve play. Now, Steve's name is spelled with a PH, but in the program, it's spelled with a V. So I said to little Vinny, they misspelled your brother's name. And little Vinny looked up at me and said, oh, how did they do that? And I said, they left out the L. And the look, the mingled look of horror and disbelief on your face has stayed with me ever since. And if I can't get that look out of you at least once in an episode, I feel somehow like I've, I've failed. <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay. Um, story with Charles. You know, I think the biggest happening, because Charles and I didn't obviously hang out a lot when we were, I was younger because obviously it's such a big age difference. It was mostly, you know, Steve, Charles, Bill, and that group. Um, but, um, but obviously Charles was around a lot, went to a lot of, a lot of our parties, um, was involved, highly involved with the local bookstore, Catholic treasure. So I saw him a lot, but it's like, we didn't hang out, so to speak. You were too um, little. I was too little. I mean, I was, I was a little Vinny. Um, so, um, but um, one of the coolest moments, I think, that I'm, I'm grateful for Charles to um, facilitate, if you will, um, I think it was mid-90s, maybe early 90s even, man, 30 years ago. Wow. Um, it was when he fa you facilitated and you were taking care of King Kigali. Yeah. Who was an exiled king from Rwanda? Yep. And um, he was that father oh, he, who passed away. I forgot the, the Father M. Father Melito. Father Melito. Yeah. Yep. Father Melito. So um, that was kind of an underground TLM back in the day, huh? I remember, I thought this is so weird. It's in a building. It was such a strange place to offer mass but um you you know everyone was doing what they had to do back in the day um but king kigali that was quite an experience it's in, i mean it's the only time i've actually been in the presence of a king and it just he just happened to be literally the biggest person i've ever met in my entire life and i shook his hand and it was the absolute biggest hand I've ever shook in my entire life. And he, he was, I mean, he, he was over seven foot. No, I mean, yep, it felt he was seven foot two, seven foot two man. <laughs> Incredible. And this, and this little Vinny. And, and his little, yeah, little tiny me. And, and I'm shaking his hand. And, and so that was quite a moment, huh? And, um, he was a very gentle man, you know. Obviously, he spe he, he spoke French, and but the way he moved um, and just the way he carried himself, I feel like, was incredibly. Um, you could tell he was a special person, you know. Yeah, you definitely could. Uh, I remember uh, he was out here twice, or out in LA twice. I remember we put on an, a uh, uh, an event for him at the uh, Mayflower Club in the. San Fernando Valley, and Tequila Mockingbird came and sat uh, at the table with the king and myself. They got on real, very well. But after that, people kept coming up to her asking if she was the queen of Rwanda. <laughs> I she bet she loved no. that. Oh, no. well, she, she did, but she said, no, no, I'm not. She said, but if, if he's looking for one, I'm happy to apply for the job. <laughs> Uh, she didn't. She didn't know French, did she? She doesn't know French. No. Uh, yeah. No. But I, I played translator. That's funny. And you know, she uh, then is now Tequila was always very exotically dressed, so he uh, he was interested in what she had to say, and vice versa. So it, was, it was a fun time. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, oh. I, I'm. I'm curious to how he would react to her eccentricities and her energy he liked him yeah he liked him you know who, who uh, was uh, always very fond of uh, tequila also was my mother wow that's incredibly random 
Well, that was the thing about mom. I never knew who she would like or dislike among my friends. And I, to this day, I can't tell you what. You can't tell the algorithm that you have to no. meet to. Wow. No. I, 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 have, I have absolutely no idea. But they, they really got on very, very well. And in fact, um, uh, mother, uh, when when well, one of one of the the jokes, if you will, Tequila and I early on in our in our knowing one another at the uh, late lamented masters club, it was decided that we should have a party because everybody was bored. But we couldn't settle on what kind of a party to have, you know, graduation, wake, etc. Finally, it was resolved we'd have a wedding reception. Okay, but who's going to get married? Well, Tequila and me. And we were married by the uh, manager of the bar, like the captain of a ship. Wow. So from that day to this, our running gag has been that ours is the longest lasting and most successful marriage in Hollywood, uh, even though it's uh, neither legal nor consummated because it lasted longer than most. But this came up at my 30th birthday party 30, 32 years ago. And, you know, Tequila and I always introduce each other to, to other people as my husband, my wife. We've been doing that for years. So as a result, people kept coming up to my mother and saying, what's it like having Charles in a mixed marriage? And mother said, oh, it's not a mixed marriage. They're both Catholic. <laughs> so she played along. Yeah. Wow. And that was her, her, oh, they're both Catholic. It's not a mixed marriage. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a good story. Yeah. yeah. A lot of good times back then. Oh, you know uh, who's got in touch with me? Kind of a shout out. Alice Lopez. Uh, I'm not familiar. Well, Alice Lopez was a member of the uh, Tridentine Mass crowd 20 years ago and more in the L.A. area. And your brother knew her and Kirk knew her and all that. Um, anyway, it's, if you don't remember who she is, it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. but, uh, it, it was good to hear from her again. Oh, great. That's awesome. She's still around? Yeah, still around. Well, not in L.A. That's why we don't see her. Oh, okay. She moved a long time ago, and she was the one before she moved. And this is 20 years ago, if it's a day. She threw, a, uh, she threw an early 60s party. So not as hippies, but as early 60s people. Yeah. JFK era. I, I, I like that. Uh, early 60s, not late 60s, early no, 60s. No, not mid 60s, mad time. <laughs> wow. It was fun. It was fun. Hmm. All right. Um, we have a question from Clark. All right. He says, uh, I will be confirmed at the Easter Vigil this year. I've chosen to take Pope St. Gregory the Great as my patron saint. He's the patron saint of teachers, which is my profession. Will Charles just speak about this pope, his legacy, and mention any good books or resources about him? I read that he was largely responsible for converting the Anglo-Saxons and many of the Aryan-Germanic peoples to Catholicism. Uh, because so much of my heritage is English, this is one reason I've grown to admire him so much. And I hope that through his intercession, England will once again become Our Lady's Dowry. Amen. Well, Pope St. Gregory the Great was Pope in the 500s. Uh, he became the leading temporal figure in Rome as Byzantine power was waning. He, um, uh, well, I mean, we call Gregorian chant after him because he sort of regularized uh, the chant. Before he was Pope, he was the ambassador of the former Pope to the Emperor at Constantinople. And while there, he composed the uh, what is called today the Liturgy of the Pre-Sanctified, which is used in the Byzantine Rite during Lent. Uh, he wrote the famous Dialogues of St. Gregory the Great, one of which is the best and earliest life of St. Benedict that we had. But he wrote, there were other elements of the Dialogues, which were quite, quite something. 
Uh, and as Clark rightly points out, he initiated the mission to England. And what happened was that he was in the slave market in Rome. They still had slavery. And he saw a group of captive English kids for sale. And he was so taken by their beauty that he said, non angli, said angeli, said angeli. Not angles, but angels. And he decided that with such beautiful appearing people, you should have souls to match. So he sent St. Augustine of Canterbury, a monk of his own uh, abbey on Monticello, to uh, Kent. And the Augustinian mission was the beginning of the conversion of the Anglo Saxons. Hmm. Okay. Question from John. He has a great question. I love these types of questions. Um, uh, hi, Charles and Vincent. I wanted to know if Charles thinks that the mental health crisis in America is tied to a lack of faith and true spirituality. I would say so. I would say so. I mean, when you're living a lie, bad things happen. And if you don't have the true faith, then you have a lie. And if you don't have any faith, you have a much bigger lie. Um, it was Vladimir Soloviev. Let me see if I can find the quote. It's a really, really good quote. Mm, Vladimir Soloviev was a Russian writer who became Catholic and had a lot of really interesting things to say. Um, While you're searching for that, um, I'll just give a couple couple of my thoughts you know i feel like the answer to this question it's so big in terms of why is there a mental health crisis and all the factors that go into it is enormous um you know one of the things obviously obviously we we talk about this a lot it's it's social isolation you know it's cabin fever you know people people don't know how to socialize people don't don't go out as much, you know, the young people, there's, there's so many things that are trying to turn them in, put, turn them into like, like, um, the Japanese situation, right? Where you just have your, put you in a little box and then that's your life. And, um, anyhow, did you find it, Charles? I did. Okay. Uh, this is Vladimir Soloviev at Russia, the Universal Church. Quote, for lack of an imperial power, genuinely Christian and Catholic, the Church has not succeeded in establishing social and political justice in Europe. The nations and states of modern times, freed since the Reformation from ecclesiastical surveillance, have attempted to improve upon the work of the Church. The results of the experiment are plain to see. The idea of Christendom as a real, though admittedly inadequate unity embracing all the nations of Europe has vanished. The philosophy of the revolutionaries has made praiseworthy attempts to substitute for this unity the unity of the human race, with what success is well known. A universal militarism transforming whole nations into hostile armies, and itself inspired by a national hatred such as the Middle Ages never knew. A deep inner and irreconcilable social conflict. A class struggle which threatens to whelm everything in fire and blood. And a continuous lessening of moral power in individuals witnessed too by the constant increase in mental collapse, suicide, and crime. Such is the sum total of the progress which secularized Europe has made in the last three or four centuries. The two great historic experiments out of the Middle Ages and that of modern times seem to demonstrate conclusively that neither the church lacking the assistance of a secular power, which is distinct but responsible to her, nor the secular state relying upon its own resources, can succeed in establishing Christian justice and peace on the earth. The close alliance and organic union of the two powers, without confusion and without division, is the indispensable condition of true social progress. It remains to inquire whether there is in the Christian world a, capable, a power capable of taking up the work of Constantine and Charlemagne with better hope of success. So, what, is, uh, what does this tell us? It tells us that not only is there a, is the, has the lack of faith put us where we are, it's put us worse than 
we might be had other things prevailed. Um, because you see, church and state were meant to cooperate together for the common good. That they don't, that the state is all powerful, as we saw under COVID, and the church has become a sort of disembodied spirit that exists purely at the whim of the secular leadership has brought us where we are. But you know, uh, a couple a couple other things that come to mind. Um, well, I forgot what, exactly how we were talking. We came up. Um, we were talking about an anecdote where a secular person was talking about the nameless dread that yeah. they fear. There, there is a nameless dread, and I hypothesize it's the nameless dread is the fact that your philosophy, the math on your philosophy, doesn't actually add up. You know, I mean, I feel like so yeah. much unhappiness is simply due to people don't know how to explore or con they're not contemplating the deeper meanings of the world. Again, the world wants to put you in this night, this small little box where you're like, you know, you produce and you consume and then that's your life and then that's it. And then we, you, we don't go outside that box uh, f um, e mentally or physically, you know, no. um, and but it's so debilitating. Um, I just can't understate that. And I see so many young people subject to it. My heart bleeds uh, for them. Um, you know, you, you've got to break out of that. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of social anxiety, um, you know, years ago. And so I was sort of trying to break through. Um, because I, I, in my opinion, it was due to a lack of social opportunities and confidence that is gotten from social encounters, right? Um, yeah. And because that's how you that's how you gain confidence. That's one way. Um, and so I was reading up on on confidence a lot, you know, and, and it occurred to me that um, I think people who are not religious are especially disadvantaged. Because what is confidence rooted in? How do you get confident? How do you become confident? And um, through my own um, searching, I believe that confidence is rooted in the belief that whatever happens to you, you're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And as Catholics, that is profoundly tied up in faith. I mean, we have faith. We, we, we can be confident because we have our faith there. And if we're living truly, truly and honestly to the best of our ability, if we're doing God's will and we're responding to the graces at a reasonable rate, we can have that confidence there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, where, which, whereas secular people, they can't have that. When, and, you know, you see so many of these people where you know, you know they're masking up why are they masking up oh because oh. anybody could die at any second because life is random and meaningless and then that's the story of you well yeah, yeah I, your, I would have an story comes for that i would be anxious too if i had that philosophy right that's horrible that's horrible don't do that it is it is it's horrible and unfortunately widespread so anyhow that's my two cents on that so Take care of yourselves mentally, ladies and gentlemen. Um, best way to do that is take to, care of yourselves. To read up on on the Catholic faith. So, um, yeah. All right. Uh, questions from Helvicio. Are you ready, Charles? I am ready. All right. All right, uh, Helvicio asks, why is the French ver version of Les Miserables 100,000 words longer than the unabridged English translation? What are the French hiding from us? I've asked that question a million times. The truth. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a, cumulative, a cumulative thing because 
what can I say? It it takes you could be more concise in English. That's all. Oh, I see. So it takes more words to say the same thing in French. Yeah, but you say it better. Oh, but you say it better. But it's okay. It's really complex. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, why were Victor Hugo's last words, I see black light? It seems like a weird thing to say. I don't know. And it does sound like a weird thing to say. Victor Hugo, I have to admit, is not one of my favorite writers. What did he write? Hunchback of Notre Dame, Les Chouans, Les Miserables, Count of Monte Cristo. No, the Count of Monte Cristo was Dumas. Yes, it was, yeah. Okay. Um, I see black light. That's weird. That's kind of scary. That's kind of an oxymoron there, huh? Well, I don't know. You've seen black light uh, posters. Well, that's, okay. That's something else. All right. Uh, I started reading Will Durant's Story of Civilization. I can't help but get the impression that a lot of things he tells about prehistoric mankind, especially their loose sexual mores, are fabrications of modern scholarship. What do you think about that? I agree. I mean, we like to think that our ancestors lived down to our worst our worst uh, uh, temptations. Uh but we don't really have any proof of that. And of course, Will Durant's own life was kind of disordered. So he came back to the church before he died, thank God. But his was a pretty wild time. And his histories, although they're very useful, they're also very biased. Anti-Catholic. Okay. Uh Last question from Helvicio is he would like to know if Charles could enlighten us about the history of the church in China, and if he could please do so. We can. Well, basically, uh, the church in China, Christianity was originally brought by the Nestorian church as early as the six or seven hundreds. It, tra it traveled to China through the Silk Route. Uh Catholic Christianity only came to China in the 1300s when Italian missionaries began making their way from Rome. Uh, it grew slowly and then rapidly under the Ming Dynasty, even more so under the Qing. And in fact, in the 1700s, I think it was the Kangxi Emperor, looked as though he was going to convert, which would have been tremendous. We've even got a poem he wrote to the Virgin Mary. Unfortunately, the dispute arose between the uh, uh, Franciscans, Dominicans, Jesuits, etc., over the Chinese rites, which were various various rituals uh, to Confucius and so on that had been considered by the missionaries to be merely patriotic and so not pagan worship. But the Dominicans were able to convince Rome that it was pagan worship, and so the Chinese rites were condemned. And that led to Kangxi turning against the faith. And instead, um, well, instead opening yet another uh, persecution against the faith. So there are a lot of Chinese martyrs uh, for Catholicism. Their numbers were increased um, by things like the Boxer Rebellion. In 1912, the Qing Dynasty was overthrown, and in 1942, um, 1941, 1942, the invasion of a number of uh, foreign enclaves in China by the Japanese, that gave the church a big problem. Hmm. But the biggest, of course, was the takeover of the mainland by the Reds in 1949, subsequent to which they broke the Concordat with Rome and set up the uh, Patriotic Church, which was a puppet organization. 
today, Pope Francis, uh, now mind you, there was a, a patriotic, or not patriotic, a, an underground church, which continued to be loyal to the Pope, and did its best to persevere until the current pontificate when the Pope signed a deal with the Red Chinese government and ordered the underground church to comply with whatever that government had them do. So, hmm. the uh, of course, the church in China still survives on Taiwan and to a degree in Hong Kong and Macau. Do you think... Uh... So what where, where do you cite on the on the decision? Um, do you cite with the Dominicans? No. And in fact, it was rescinded 200 years later. But that was too late, of course. Hmm. That is, that's a frustrating what if. Yeah. All right. We are going to have one last question from Nicholas, superfan Nicholas. All right. He says, hello, gentlemen. I am far away from being a father. I still need to finish law school and get my career underway, but I have a feeling that it is never too early to begin preparing for fatherhood. I did not grow up in a Catholic family. My parents raised me vaguely Anglican, even though we are mostly Italian genetically. Mm. Nonetheless, I know that I need to convert to Catholicism. I am entirely convinced, and I thank you for that seed of belief I was granted when I first discovered Tumblr House in my early college days. I intend yeah, to begin... Mm. I intend to begin the process of converting very soon. I simply need to overcome my shyness and laziness. To get to the point, I intend on being Catholic and I intend on being a father. I'm very grateful for how my father raised me. I know it was through his parenting that I have been blessed with every positive attribute that has gotten me to my childhood dream of reaching law school and my ability to think for myself and come to the conclusion that Catholicism is the one true faith among other things. However, he did not raise me Catholic, and I honestly am not sure how I would begin to approach providing my potential children with the faith. I fear that I may be too overbearing and cause the nightmare of causing my children to rebel against my wishes or may not provide enough reinforcement. If you have any advice to give, insight to pro provide, or even books to recommend that I should read, I would be immensely grateful. I also somewhat apologize for the length of this question, but considering that I have been a loyal patron for quite some time now, I am also not, in all honesty, truly sorry. <laughs> Dude, that's totally fine, Nicholas. You don't send in a lot of questions compared to other people. And um, as you say, you're a patron. All you people out there who are not patrons and want to send in questions, you can do so for as little as $5 a month. Uh, join us on Patreon, please. Um, we'd be happy to have you. We have a nice little community there. All right. That's for sure. All right, Charles, uh, All right. advice on fatherhood? Yes, Didio. Um The first thing to bear in mind is that if the faith is important to you, it'll be important to them. That's the one thing. The second thing is that you're right to worry about beating them over the head with it. Uh, but if they admire you, and they see that it's important to you beyond just going on Sundays, they'll follow your lead. Um, that, you know, never. Hmm? No, I was going to say that that is, you know, I'm kind of in the same spot as Nicholas, where I'm not a father yet, but I'm intend to be. And so I'm going through the same things. And I actually had arrived at that same thing that it has to, you have to communicate how important it is uh, to your children and you can, but you can do that in a way where you're not overbearing to me. It occurred to me, I was listening to a priest and he was being so challenging and all this and that, but he didn't challenge himself in my opinion. Like he doesn't challenge himself. Like I don't feel like he's an actual good leader, but he's like telling everybody else to do all these things. So his message was not well received by me. And I feel like any father, like you need to live it. You, you can't just preach it. You have to live it. And to say it a different way, I feel like Father Ripker had great advice. Um, the most important advice, actually. 
which is that it's a father's job to suffer for his family. Well, that's true. That's true. And I, I would add, get to know your kids as individuals. Bear in mind that while you have a part in forming them, they really are independent individuals to the moment of their conception. They are beings. Uh, and you ask yourself, why should they listen to me? Why should they want to spend time with me? Well, be the kind of person you want to spend time with. Be enjoyable. Be fun. Uh, my dad was, and we took everything he said as gospel. Hmm. So, but but that's... yeah, you know what I'm saying though about the suffering though. In in other words, like because yeah. I feel like that kind of closes the circle because you're saying it's important, and so that means you have to do the things you have to do, which include you know which might be a suffering to you, but it's part of your Catholic faith and it's part of showing your kids. You know, I, it ties into my my Pope Benedict quote, right? That that I, is sort of the guide for my life. The, the world offers you comfort, but you are not made for comfort; you're made for greatness. Yeah. So in this no, sense, very true. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so I, I'm I'm just curious though. Uh, are you are you feeling? Are you feeling any of the results of self healing at the moment? Self-healing? Um, I don't know. I mean, we we finished the show. That always feels good. I feel like I've I've healed a little bit. Um, you know. Well, you, you know, if you're in a position right now where you're feeling all stressed by the need to to put out the show, I want you to to allow yourself to accept the fact that every show we put out is different. And if you don't think we're hitting the same high range, or, or even if you think we're hitting too high, give yourself permission to accept it. All right, Charles, I got to stop you there. Off the menu is now being broadcast in <laughs> podcast on the Crusade Channel. Talk radio the way it should be at crusadechannel.com. Oh. <laughs> you were saying. I can see. I can see you're not, you're not into self-help right now or self-healing. You know, I, let me just say that in this Lenten, Lenten progress we're all in, self-healing is an important thing. <sighs> Wait, whatever. Sure. Okay. What do you mean, whatever? This is a deeply pious thought. Don't you want your awareness raised? What mystery of the rosary focuses on self-healing and raising awareness? The 17th. <laughs> the 17th? Okay. Oh, there. okay. That's one of, the, right. one of the luminous, I guess. No, no, illuminous. Illuminous, okay. The illuminous mistress. Okay. They're, they're, they're really difficult and bizarre. Okay. All right, All that's right. going to do it for this episode. Remember, if it's Monday... It's it, off the menu. And the soul you've saved... Maybe your own. See you next time, God bless you all, gang. We shall see you next week from the old Sot. The Sot. 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 Old Sot. We'll see you. <laughs> we'll see you guys. <laughs>